So thanks for introducing. And first of all, VIRAC stands for Ventus International Radio Astronomy Center. We are three master students at Ventus University College studying electronics engineering. Also, we are quite new employees at this institution. We will try to give you some insight what, about history and what we are doing and about future plans. So first of all, about location. So, so, so here, here we are in Hamburg. And if you fly with about two hours by plane to east, here is the Republic of Latvia in Eastern Europe. Then if you go by car to the west, about three hours, this is our city, Ventspils, here there is Virak headquarters placed. And when you go another 30, 30, yes, another 35 kilometers by car, you can find a place called Irbene. In Google Maps it looks like this. And if you look closer, you can notice some interesting object. There are two of them. So what's about history? So since the World War II, when Soviet Union occupied Latvia, it was a place for a military base because this place was quite perfect for such a such something military and thank you something military and something very secret because Ventspils district is has the smallest population density in Latvia. It has a lot of woods. And, and as you see, no signs of life in radius of 35 kilometers, actually. So it was logical that right in this place, Soviets began to play with some antennas and some spying, because this Ventspils is almost most western part of USSR. So it was very close to evil western countries. Yes, yeah, so this was the motivation. We do not know exactly when and how and why, but at first they started playing with smaller antennas and they be larger and larger. That's when about 75, they built what we now call RT-16. It is antenna with 16 meter diameter dish. And this masterpiece with two, twice larger 32 diameter Dish, which is largest in the in the north North Europe. Uh, such object was not unique in USSR. There were similar places in, for example, in Ukraine, Kazakhstan, etc. There were not only antennas, but there was also a small military town near to antennas, where we if we don't know exactly somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 inhabitants, including office soldiers, officers, their families, and technical personnel. Here you can see some remains of this military town. There are living buildings. This town was completely secret. It appeared on no maps, but it had everything. Buildings, kindergartens, its own school, and even whip sauna for, for whip so soldiers. And it has it had the code name Starlet, this object. It is clear that about 75, the complex of Irben uh, consisted of three antennas. The larger one, 32, uh, the, uh, yes, this 32 meter, 16 meter antenna and about eight antenna. We don't know exactly the diameter because Russians took this antenna away somehow. I don't know how they managed, but they managed. So, <laughs> yes, actually, we don't have much information about the past. It's like about Egyptian pyramids. We, we, we can notice this, 
but there are no material how they build and nothing, no instructions, and so I explain why later. So these antennas, three antennas, were connected by underground tunnels, by cables, because in order to hide all electromagnetic radiation, because not in order not to betray the position, because these antennas were working only in receiving regime. And what these antennas were doing, one, one application was as Soviets sent missions to Venus and Mars, maybe it, they were used for communicating with these zones. Also, main purpose was to spy NATO satellites who provided communication link between America and Brussels, Europe, headquarters of NATO. And another application, after studying the weirdness of GEARS, it was concluding that the largest antenna was pointed most of its time in direction of Norway, where was um, NATO submarine maintenance base. So that uh, was, yeah, here you can see how tuna looks now. There were all the cables, surprisingly missing. Uh, this is a data center where some preliminary data was, was processed with Soviet supercomputers, placing this between the first and second etage here, middle. And then data was by cable maybe sent to some place called Krunda Locator, which was not secret to NATO. And then via wireless link, it was connected to Moscow. And there is a legend that Soviets knew the freshest NATO information faster than in Pentagon. It was quite effective thing. Yes. And this object remained for NATO undiscovered about year 1880 when the when USSR invaded uh, Afghanistan. Then it was peak combination of Cold War. As you know, Reagan called then USSR Aero Empire and began to study more careful what commies are doing in their territory. And with, sat and with satellite imaging, they fi find out these antennas and understood the, these applications. So in year 91, Latvia gained independence after USSR collapsed. But till 94, the base, the military base was still here under new Russian Federation flag, when it was agreed that Russian troops has to leave the territory of Latvia. First of all, Russians wanted to keep these unique antennas, although it was a little bit outdated te technology for satellite spying, but they wanted to keep it because they are ideal, ideal per parabolic antennas. But Rus uh, Latvia refused. And then Russians understand if they can't keep it, they wanted to blow up these antennas. But it was saved by Latvian radio astronomers, who before had only 20 meters dish, and they wanted to use for scientific purposes. There were difficult negotiations between Latvia and Russia, and finally Russians agreed, agreed to leave. Um, antennas to Latvia, but some conditions. First of all, these antennas will be never used in military purposes, and especially against Russia. Another price for it, all documentation was destroyed or taken to Moscow. Also, all communication control system was destroyed, all cables were cut, and also some acid was spurred in, uh, in electromotors. So it's in order, it was not movable anymore. And also, they, as I said, they took away this antenna. We still don't know the diameter of it. And here is 
It, it was the oldest one. At first, they were both smallest and then the largest. So we can see how it looks like now. Yes, and here you can see remains of that military town as it is useless and not nowadays and a little bit dangerous. It's now it's step by step demolished. And it took almost four years for enthusiastic radio astronomers to to restore these antennas. And in 1998, there were first observations of, of space. It was a difficult task to restore, as there were no documentation, there were a lot of wires. This, this control system used railway logic, lamps, and other Soviet hardcore things. Yes. But it helps that all control systems were duplicated, there are two of each, so using two, they built one. <laughs> and so in 1998, the Virak was born. Well, was born. And my colleague Roberts will tell you more about not, not so deep past and now. Yes. Um, hello. Um, um, so, uh, my name is Roberts, and uh, I will talk about uh, what engineers and radio astronomers uh, had to go through to get this thing rotating. So, the 32-meter dish uh, now uh, is able to receive signals at 5 gigahertz and below. So uh, it, is, it has already been used for radio astronomy. Uh, it has been used a little bit in test regime for satellite tracking. And, uh, so, and this is uh, the result of uh, this coll coll collaboration of uh, engineers and researchers at Virac. So the first thing uh, they uh, encountered was uh, the fact that uh, these structures were um, abandoned for a lot of years and even when radio astronomers uh, got their hands on these uh, objects, uh, they didn't have the funding to rebuild them or main even maintain them properly. So um, they uh, had to uh, come up with 3D design of these radio telescopes, uh, which they did by measuring each and every one uh, section of the radio telescope construction by hand. So, um, when it was done, uh, finally uh, they had uh, they uh, simulated these uh, wind uh, forces and gravity forces uh, that. Uh, uh, could damage in potentially could damage or uh, or are already damaged damaging uh, the radio telescope so the result was that um, they uh, discovered that uh, both radio telescopes are in great need of uh, uh, repairs especially the metal constructions below the uh, uh, primary refle reflector So, um, going inside uh, one of these radio telescopes, this is RT-16. Um, I'll walk you through the structure, uh, maybe, uh, like uh, on the top, starting from top, uh, we have the primary focus point. Uh, usually, uh, mount the, uh, all the equipment there, so below it, below that is this little uh, this little cabin, uh, which is uh, used for storing the uh, receivers. So this is the closest point that you can get, actually, uh, to an antenna, from antenna to receiver. Um, below that, we have the uh, primary reflector, 16-meter uh, diameter. Uh, further down, uh, there, is, there are these um, electromotors um, here. Um, uh, which control the elevation 
And uh, further below, see this uh, pipe looking thing going down, that's the rotation axis for the radio telescope. And inside this axis, there are this uh, stairway uh, up to the uh, uh, top of the um, radio telescope. So, uh, and at the bottom of the axis, there's the control motors for the uh, azimuth. So, um, and further down, there's uh, basically only rooms for um, uh, personnel and, and other equipment. And uh, at the uh, basement, uh, there's the entrance to the uh, very, very scary uh, caves, not caves, the tunnels uh, where the uh, wires were. So, um, so yeah, uh, engineers had to figure out a way to interface with the 70s technologies, and uh, so everything everything was mostly relay logic, and uh, and if it wasn't well, interfaces were usually parallel or some non-standard ones. Uh, so. For example, here we can see that uh, uh, one of our leading researchers uh, designed this uh, on uh, uh, optically isolated uh, control system uh, based on FPGA, and uh, this was all programmed in LabVIEW um, to control, just to control the uh, motors. So, and this actually works now. This is approved. Another thing, uh, for example, if you can control uh, the radio telescope, that's very good, but we also need to know the angle of uh, how it's uh, rotating and also speed, um, angular speed. So there is this uh, optical um, angle measurement system. Uh, it's essentially a disk with transparent and non-transparent uh, uh, sectors which form a gray code if you look at the radius line like this. So um, it's been exposed with the, uh, this, uh, uh, light bulbs on one side and the uh, code is being read with the optical sensors on the other side. So uh, when we g get this code, uh, it's also a good thing to uh, feed this information back into the system that is co controlling the uh, telescope in the first place. So, um, for example, uh, this device was um, made uh, uh, by by some students uh, in uh, Ventspils University College. So this is basically an interface uh, interface with computer or, or uh, uh, other systems. So. Okay, and uh, also uh, many RF and, and uh, RF stuff need had to be uh, made uh, to establish uh, like uh, even uh, simple uh, observations or, or experiments with radio telescopes. So, for example, uh, this device uh, containing filters, amplifiers, and uh, mixers is um, was made uh, to. Uh, perform uh, ionosphere uh, research. Uh, this was used to receive sat uh, like satellite signals, which were uh, traveling through a turbulent area of ionosphere, which I will talk about also later on. So, and uh, this is not very Soviet anymore, thank God. Uh, uh, so. Uh, we managed uh, to get our hands on uh, some basic equipment uh, that uh, helped to um, get telescopes back on the feet. Uh, so, most important things were the spectrum analyzers and uh, signal generators, um, and also the uh, digital baseband converter and data storage system. So, and uh, speaking of uh, baseband converters. Uh, this is a baseband converter that converts, uh, uh, it was, I think, uh, 16 megahertz bandwidth um, uh, into 
the data. And uh, this was the first digital converter that was used in radio telescope, actually. So by then, um, this, there's this um, organization, EVN, uh, European VLBI network, uh, pronounced that uh, from now on there will be only uh, digital baseband converters in all radio telescopes. And we somehow managed to buy the very, very first uh, baseband converter, which was not really a very good idea because it came with, <laughs> of course, uh, it's world's first device will come with the, all the problems <laughs> that can you possibly imagine. But, uh, yeah, uh, we managed uh, to uh, get it working, so now now it works pretty good. So, and uh, yeah, and here you can see a data storage device. We just uh, put some eight uh, hard drives into this uh, slot there, and um, yeah, um, so all this data coming from conver converter is uh, sent to this device and all written into uh, drives. Okay, so another very important, com important component uh, that we have now is uh, hydrogen masers. Um, so they are basically atomic clocks, but they're not keeping uh, track of time as such. They're just generating um, impulses, five megahertz uh, impulses, which are uh, extremely precise, it was 10 to 10 to minus 15 uh, seconds, precise. So we generate these signals and then uh, use also GPS data to have this uh, very precise time, uh, time constant like uh, in the radio telescopes, which is also very important for VLBI uh, mode. So, um, very great achievement uh, for our scientists was when uh, in 2013 um, they managed to observe this uh, asteroid uh, uh, 2012 uh, DA14, which is uh, 20 by 40 meters about. And um, this achievement uh, basically uh, marked this. Uh, uh, sort of new life uh, for the radio telescopes because uh, uh, finally th it was proven that uh, even with limited resources and uh, budget uh, uh, researchers and science engineers can uh, make this thing going. <laughs> so, and yeah, and speaking about VLBI, so it's calls yeah very long base interferometry. Uh, means, for example, um, we work in collab collaboration with other radio telescopes. Um, for example, here in Epatoria, there's a RT70, 70, 70 meter diameter uh, dish, which is transmitting a signal, powerful signal uh, to something in space, for example, uh, debris or uh, satellite or anything else. And uh, other t radio telescopes, including ours, are observing this point and receiving the reflected signals. Uh, then after correlating the data, we can get out, uh, for example, the shape, speed, and then all kind of physical parameters of the object. So this is also a very big thing for us, so working in collaboration with other radio telescopes. Yeah, and uh, speaking, I uh, mentioned ionosphere research, so uh, also did uh, this experiment uh, in which also, also in VLBI mode, two radio telescopes are observing one point in sky and uh, I can see the, uh, the radio teles telescope uh, line of sight crosses a um, region of artificial turbulence, which is um, actually heated ion ionosphere, uh, which is heated by 
uh, antenna array, which outputs uh, 500 kilowatts of power directly into ion ionosphere, heats it up, and um, so creating this uh, artificial uh, region. And this was used uh, to uh, observe how this uh, uh, highly ionized cloud is uh, forming. And um, it also was concluded that this uh, place, Sura, it's in Russia, that um, antenna array can practically paralyze any uh, GPS or GLONASS signals within the region of this turbulence. So they ionize this part so much, no uh, GPS signals get through, through it, basically. Oh. Another very uh, uh, basic application for our radio telescope at the moment is uh, observation of the sun. Uh, so we use this uh, telescope. Uh, you can see here uh, there's this uh, blue dot. It's uh, the point towards which uh, radio telescope is pointed. And we are doing this uh, scanning of whole uh, surface of the sun. And uh, then we have uh, we can get, get uh, data that represents uh, um, radio emissions of the sun, which uh, usually represents uh, activ sun activity. So we can see any like black, uh, dark spots or, or, or uh, eruptions or something like that. And for example, in this animation, you can see how this is done during the day. So each time we just scan the whole sun and get this data and we put together those uh, peaks and we have the uh, radio uh, image of, of, of the sun. So yeah, uh, that was um, uh, all about uh, the applications and, and stuff that had to be done. And uh, I will ask my colleague Raivis and continue on um, the future plans in the grand, grand scheme. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my colleague's previous was telling about history and present, about uh, Virak, and I will a little bit tell more about uh, future plans. And in Virak, we are planning uh, to get new cryogenic uh, receivers. Uh, basically, they are wideband receivers from 4 to uh, 4.5 until 8.8 .8 gigahertz. Uh, it's based on hemp technology. It's also use uh, it's semi intensely can use uh, right, uh, right and left uh, circular polarization. It's um, main beam loop isn't very wide, it's uh, very directive, it's just 21 uh, degree, and it's cryogenic system uh, use pure helium to cool down a receiver. Uh, the nice te temperature of that must be like something 10 until uh, 15 Kelvin. So it's pretty impressive to detect uh, low noise signals. Uh, yeah, and it is optimized for 6.7 gigahertz. It's actually split uh, in uh, 1.2 gigahertz bands, uh, and uh, that band cannot uh, uh, get worse than two decibels in attenuation. And uh, it's uh, basically working uh, at uh, these are main working frequencies. Uh, uh, but uh, it's basically meant for uh, VLBI observations. Uh, for now, we are just uh, joining a couple of uh, these VLB observations, but uh, if we get uh, these receivers, we can more often uh, join these uh, observations. Uh, also, this is a new adjustment system uh, where we will put a receiver, this cryogenic receiver, uh, it can manually adjust uh, uh, where perfectly is the focus point uh, where to need to be a receiver focus point. 
And so, and uh, this is also a uh, quite new generator that uh, we will use for emergency when uh, uh, power will lost because it is quite windy region and uh, there quite often happen like that and that's why we need because if its uh, power is lost then these measures are also shut down and uh, we will just get on tracks to observe just until I don't know like half of a year it will take so it's quite a long time that's why we definitely need this and uh, there is a plan to renovate uh, uh, this RT16 uh, so it will uh, happen next year. Uh, what we need to do is uh, change its primary mirror uh, with uh, composite material dish. And, uh, and we will also put new motor drives for it. Then it can uh, faster move, its uh, velocity will be greater, and it can uh, then track satellites and use it uh, as high-speed downlink. Uh, also, we will renovate RT32. Actually, this we're going to do in October. So if you want to uh, watch our antennas, so you need quite quickly come to us uh, uh, in summertime. Uh, and we will also renovate its primary mirror uh, and its supporting structure, because there is quite a lot of rust in that uh, structure. We definitely need to do that, uh, and there is uh, a new. Uh, we will also uh, get new motor and drives, and uh, it will also move faster. Uh, maybe also with this antenna, we will track satellites too. Uh, and yeah, we will get a new control system because old one is quite old, <laughs> and it's uh, better get new one. And some other future plans is uh, get antennas working uh, uh, 24 hours and seven days in week. Uh, we will uh, basically for research, satellite tracking, uh, VLB observations, and so on. Uh, sun activities also, uh, and we will. Uh, we have quite a lot of these projects in uh, Iraq, and uh, one of the projects uh, is meant for uh, creating new sampling system, uh, get uh, you know, digital converters with some pre-processing -processing, uh, uh, devices uh, based on FPGA. Yeah, and we will also produce new signal processing device for our um, radio telescopes and algorithms, how to process the data also based on FPJ. So we very hope that we will uh, transform our Soviet relic uh, antennas to a new uh, radio astronomic uh, center. Yeah. So thank you for your attention. Maybe we have a little bit of time and we can show some time-lapse of uh, antenna. You can show it. So. Yes, this is uh, what we film, the time-lapse. It's uh, how now it's moving, and we I will. Uh, it again, yeah. Yeah, so we will try to get it move faster. <laughs> so cool. thank you. Well, thank you very much for this very inspiring presentation. Hmm. Those people have questions. Um, so, who do you work with? Uh, is it focused on cooperating with other universities? Uh, do you focus on, on uh, standard astronomical research, or can essentially anyone book time on your telescope? Uh, actually, everyone can book time because uh, 
we have just some collaboration with VLBI, so uh, there we can join some observations, but we have quite now a lot of free time where to use antennas, so if you want something to research, you can just come to us and book some time for you. Except, except right now is not a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Be because it's uh, it will go on renovation this uh, I think this autumn, like they will uh, lift up the 32 meter dish and and put it on the ground so they can uh, renovate the construction. So at that time it won't be available. But after that, totally. Yes. As you have several telescopes, uh, do you plan to do interferometry with the three amongst them, or uh, just contribute to the very large base? Uh, basically, we are just uh, with other antennas uh, collaborating. We are not uh, making interferometry with each other antennas. So. You mentioned you could uh, go up to five gigahertz, and uh, then I'm thinking when you're doing long base interferometry, how big resol uh, how much resolution do you get on asteroid tracking? How how small features can you actually see on them? That actually depends on the base, like baseline of the uh, radio telescopes that, that we are working with. So, uh, but I cannot answer, I don't think any of us can answer this uh, question correctly. Um, yeah. so, uh, but uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> any further questions? Yes. Is uh, open for visitors. Um, I think if you would uh, contact us, it's not open for tourists. If that's what you. <laughs> We're not tourists here. But uh, for visitors, uh, if you of course contact us, uh, then yeah, why not? No more questions. Okay, so we start again here at 2. Thanks again for this presentation. So we start again here at 2 with a presentation from uh, Professor Imlau about uh, how you can build uh, photonics systems much, uh, in a much very cheap way. You're using uh, Lego bricks.